Hi, we're Option Conservation, and this is the Shoe Room Sessions. Talia, welcome to the Shoe Room on Tour. Um, thank you very much for coming in. Can you tell people who you are and what you do? Yes. I am Natalia Dorfman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kita. Kita is a carbon insurance company. We specialize in insuring transactions in the carbon markets. And really, we set up the company with the view that insurance is an essential enabler to help to reduce risk, identify quality, and thus ideally drive that institutional level financing to scale the high quality carbon projects. Awesome. Okay, let's dive into that. How, how on earth did you get there? Can you give us your career contents page? How did you go from where you grew up to where you are today? <laughs> it was somewhat a roundabout route, but I actually think it has combined into Kita quite perfectly, but I am so from Southern California. I've always liked being outside. I went to university in North Carolina and I majored in environment. Tar Hills? No. That's state, that's NC State, right? <laughs> yeah. okay. The, the uh, competitors to my university, okay. I went to Duke, some Blue Devils. I majored in environmental science because I thought I could go hiking, to be honest. I didn't, I spent a lot of time in a lab. Then I decided I didn't want to be an environmental scientist. I love reading and writing, so I started to work in publishing. I went to New York. I didn't like publishing. I found it slightly boring on an actual career basis. And then I ended up falling into the job of doing business development and strategy for international law firms. I got that job. I gave a speech at my sister's wedding. And afterwards, a partner came up to me and asked me if I wanted to interview for a marketing assistant job in, in New York. And so I did that for 15 years. So I did that in New York, in Brussels, and then in London. Did you ever ask them what they saw in the speech that made them want to bring you in? I didn't actually. I will say we had, uh, uh, I mean, this is, it was quite terrible. We had a, a family tragedy right before this wedding. Okay. And so I had to give this speech and it was a balancing act of, of being happy because it was a marriage uh, but then also it was quite sad and you had to balance those two things. So I feel like it was maybe an aspect of pity, but then maybe an aspect of how well I balanced those two things. Yeah, or it was clear resilience and ability to do well, there, there you go. That was possibly it. Um, but it was regardless. I never would have thought about applying for this job because who knows about marketing for law firms is such a random thing. But I did that. So I did it for 15 years. And so you get to learn a lot about law, a lot about different industry sectors, um, and then I got to live in New York, Belgium, and London. And in London, I spent eight and a half years at a insurance focused law firm called Clyde & Co. And so that is one of the world's largest insurance law firms. So I ran, for example, the UK business development insurance team, the global insurance key account program. I learned about insurance and the really specialist way it can be applied and how it really underpins the global economy. And then over time, I became promoted to global head of new business. And in that role, I led the strategy for the firm's climate risk practice. So right before founding Kita, it was a combination of looking a lot of the regulations and liabilities around climate change that were driving both insurance companies as well as a lot of other companies, of course, to change their behavior, identify the risks and the liabilities, but also look for opportunities. And, and insurance, where we were working with insurance companies to help them to identify really where they were going to be impacted by climate change and their existing insurance policies, as well as where they might want to identify new areas of risk that they could develop new policies. In your time working with those companies, how, how long have they been having real conversations about the impact of climate change? I mean, I mean so I left Glide Co now, I left in, I guess, 21. Um, at that time that I left, and we'd been working on this for a few years, it was still honestly pretty new. I remember thinking that one of the really positive things was that it had started to shift away from a kind of CSR, like this is the nice thing to do, but it's kind of a charitable donation. It had quite distinctly shifted in our clients' eyes into there is a risk here, like we could lose money and there's an opportunity here and we could make money. And the people therefore involved in the conversations had shifted from the kind of um, you know, more sort of CSR focused people who are wonderful and doing an amazing job but tend to have a smaller budget. Mm -hmm. And I had shifted more towards legal risk and finance. I think then the nuance that I felt was that it was hard to say, this is the right thing to do. We always talked in terms of risk and opportunity. And sometimes you did want to be able to say, 
listen, but there is also a right and wrong here. And I think one of the fun things about having your own business is that actually you can speak however you want and people can respond to you however you want. But we do very clearly say we think there's a right and a wrong. Um, and we won't do, for example, we wouldn't ensure a carbon project that we don't think is a quality carbon project. It needs to meet a quality threshold before it meets our risk threshold, because we do think it's important to drive finance to good projects um, if we want to scale the market effectively. It sounds like purpose is a real key driver for you. Yes. Um, and again, going back to why we started Kita, I'm by no means some kind of multimillionaire, but you know, I was relatively financially comfortable in my job and I could have continued to work in that type of job. So money wasn't the huge driver. It is purpose. And I think myself and my two co-founders feel like if we were able to scale Kita into some kind of huge, enormous financial success, so we're all very, very wealthy. But if we could look back and say, but we never actually had any positive impact, that's not really the outcome that we're going for. It is all about the purpose. And I remember sitting down with them in very early days, and you probably did the same, where we thought, well, actually, how do we take that purpose and try and embed it into values that the company can follow, such that if we are no longer with the company in the future, and again, working at law firms, you see, obviously, founders leave companies sometimes by choice and sometimes get forced out. It's just a reality of life. But we always wanted to set up the business such that if we were no longer the part of it, it still operates by these core founding principles that are so embedded into its operational fabric that it's hard to remove that purpose from its, um, its function. But likewise, we also see profit. And I like that the carbon markets have the ability to have both of those things. Because I think there's a lot of people who want purpose, but also still want you know, a comfortable life. And I think it's one of those industries that can build both of those things for people and thus can be an appealing place for people to work. Yeah, I, I always love the Patagonia bit. You know, it's the classic go-to to be a good business. You've got to be in business. Yeah. And that means being profitable. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. So to so take us to that, that founding moment, what was the thought that meant we're now ready to go, we're going to set up the new business? What, how did that start? What was that key point? So actually, I mean, before founding Kita, but after leaving Clinico, I joined an organization called Carbon 13, which is a venture builder for climate tech startups in Cambridge. And this was a way to, I suppose, leave my safe job, but with some structure. So I didn't just leave. Um, I had a, an organization to go to. And the point of Carbon 13 was to help people to find a co-founder with whom they could start a climate-focused business. And I met Paul and Tom, my co-founders there. And the idea for Kita really came from speaking to a lot of people who were looking at building some form of climate tech company. A lot of them were hard tech, so physical asset based. And I, because I'd worked with insurance for so long, when I was speaking to people and they're talking about what they wanted to do, I would always ask, well, how are you going to get insurance for this? Or how is your investor going to get insurance or your lender? And it always really surprised me how no one had ever thought about it. They were sort of just like, oh, well, just like, I'll just get it. Of course I will. But I knew that that insurance wasn't available. And if you can't access insurance or if your lender or your investor can't, at some point you just you hit a ceiling in terms of scaling because you can't access that kind of debt capital. And so Paul and Tom have financial services backgrounds as well as technology backgrounds in remote monitoring as well as building financial products. And I had the legal side where I knew how to start an insurance company and I had a lot of contacts in the industry. And so it was just this, I remember having this moment where we just thought actually we could just build an insurance company. It's not actually rocket science to build an insurance company. And then we could focus on developing really specific insurance products that the larger insurance companies wouldn't yet touch because it's a new market. And really, to be honest, relatively very, very small for a large insurance company. So that was the kind of idea. And I do remember it just came and we were like, ah, oh, we could build an insurance company. Of course we could. And that could have a huge impact, not in terms of ourselves capturing carbon dioxide, but enabling other people to do it at greater scale. We thought we could have a significant impact. That's amazing. So it sounds like that interim step from the sort of traditional safe security environment to your own startup company, that was a really important middle step. Yeah, definitely. We, um, I had the same experience. So working for the, uh, the government and the environment agency for a decade, 
it was terrible. Um, <laughs> and then worked with a really amazing engineering firm, the one I talked about, about being hazmat suited up before. And that was a real step from government public sector into a real commercial organization. And we did that for, for two and a little bit of years. And that was very much my apprenticeship of how to go from structured bureaucracy to a real uh, SME business that was operating and functioning and facing clients and things. And I think if we hadn't have had that apprenticeship, starting OC would have been really difficult. So it's funny, sometimes you need two steps to end up in yeah, your sort of I agree. I think it's nice to have, I suppose one thing that you realize is that now that I know a lot of people who've started their own business, there's no one way of it and there's no one age and there's no background of the sort of perfect founder. People come at it from all aspects. And I think I would have probably thought just by stereotypes that the best time to do it is maybe your mid-20s, you know, where you're sort of, why not give it a go? Yeah. And I did it when I was 37 and I had a three-year-old and a six-year-old. But it just sort of felt like a safe time for me. It was like, what's the worst thing that happens is it doesn't work. And then I go and get another job. It it felt it felt doable to me. I think I just turned 38 or maybe I was 37 yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I, I wasn't ready before then in terms no, of me knowledge base and network and everything like that and sort of experiencing those things that you need to. I'm, I'm really interested in the insurance world, the costs. I think people will mention insurance in passing because they'll insure their car or their property. Yeah. But no one understands that there's working outside the industry. So if you can go back to your sort of first days of stepping into that industry, can you remember some of the a few of the early things that made you go, oh, wow, I didn't realize it worked that way, or sort of realizations <laughs> that built your understanding? Yes. I actually have a very distinct memory of this at Clyde & Co. Because we had this wonderful partner who took us to Lloyd's of London, which is now where Kita works. It's this the world's largest insurance marketplace. And within Lloyd's of London are a lot of different insurance companies. And a lot of the most specialist insurance products in the world are, are sold from there. And so they took us on a tour and they were talking to us about all the different types of insurance. And both A, Lloyd's has cool insurance, like the uh, insurance policies for the Beatles, just like what happens if the Beatles, if one of them had lost their arm or lost an eye, what were the insurance, what's the value of that you know, sort of body part? So that's one, you're like, oh, you can insure, of course, you know, of course, like musicians and football players, all of them, they're like, insure their body, I, right? I, I have to tell, so <laughs> I tell you so because, so um, I loved professional wrestling as a child. Okay. So all boys kind of, th who are now 35 to 45, it was huge in the UK, so, Ultimate Warrior, the Hulk, Hulk Hogan, those type of people. Mm -hmm. And the reason I first I'd ever heard of insurance, because in the early 90s, all the professional wrestlers got Lloyds of London insurance yeah, that were getting did. injured at yeah. work. And a whole swathe of them just retired early because <laughs> the policies paid out for them not to have to work anymore. That's so I'd heard of that as like an eight-year-old or something. Had no idea what it meant, but exactly as you described those specialist policies. For, Super specialist. Yeah. But then there's things like political risk. So when you have uh, an asset in a country where maybe there's a war or a government expropriation, right, these are the kinds of insurance policies that are relevant whenever you hear about some kind of uh, unrest in any country. You can always think, what are the companies that have assets in that country? How are they protecting themselves? And how are they feeling safe to go into that country in the first place? Insurance? Um, you have, for example, during the financial crisis, there was one insurance company that was potentially at risk of going under, and it was realized that that insurance company insured the majority of the world's airlines. And if the airlines aren't insured, the airlines can't fly. It's these types of examples that you start to read about, and when you work at a law firm that, that protects the insurance companies, you see that a lot of things you read about in the news have an insurance company behind them, paying out the insurance claim, um, or sometimes not, but really being supportive to enable companies and people to take risks. And even from starting a new business, a lot of people get directors and officers insurance. And that is based on the fact that if something happened to my business, I am now can call my insurance policy instead of being held personally liable for that. So instead of something being able to come and take my house and my assets, you get this insurance policy that protects you as a director. And it's things like that that are just enablers for people to take risks. Um, and so thus, that's the analogy in the carbon markets is really, you think about it, people are investing or building assets 
that are based on physical, based on maybe trees or biochar machinery or whatever it is, it's based on something physical, but then there's this intangible asset upon it. And that intangible asset links to both the physical, which could burn down, blow down, be damaged. Um, it links to the sort of intangible, like the science and monitoring um, and ongoing auditing that identifies if that carbon credit is valid. It links to counterparties, you know, who's actually running this project? Are they fraudulent? Are they negligent? Can we assess land ownership rights? And it links to the, to the country. What happens if this country decides they're going to keep the carbon to meet their own nationally determined contributions? All these types of risks are very much in flux. And if you're able to quantify risk and price risk, then a lot of companies are willing to engage in risk because you know a lot of companies make money from engaging in risk. But if you're not able to quantify price and identify if you want to hold the risk or if you wish you want to transfer it to somebody else, it no longer is risk, it's more uncertainty. And uncertainty is the killer of capital deployment. And so I think the carbon markets are a very challenging place, but a great place to deploy insurance. Because if you can identify price and mitigate some of those risks, you can help companies to say, ah, that's the risk that I don't need to hold. I can transfer it. And thus I can free up some capital to go into this project at greater scale. And so that's what we're trying to do. And it's one of the things that people don't think about insurance in that way, but it, it can really help you to deploy more capital. When we, um, when we started OCI, I remember sitting, having a conversation with George, who's at the back of the room and the, and Matt, the general counsel at Auction House, who's awesome. And they both flagged, this is two plus years ago, the two things that, the two of the many things that aren't there yet that we need are rating agencies for carbon credits and the ability to insure carbon credits and natural capital products. And it's so nice to see you and others really bringing those, those industries into play that we need. Um, if, can you give us an overview of what the insurance um, world looks like for natural capital right now. So if someone wanted to insure a natural capital product, what's available to them today? So I would say, unfortunately, it's still a relatively niche product. And so if I fast forward to the future, I think you'll be able to access a portfolio of insurance. So based on your way of engaging in the market and your risks you wish to cover, I think you'll be able to pick and choose just like you would in other industries. However, in today's market, it's, it's, it's not yet there. And so I would segment the insurance availability into by stage of project. So just, I know these are buckets, but let's call it delivery risk. Mm -hmm. So the project is still at a kind of planning and implementation stage. It might've forecasted the number of credits. It thinks it will deliver in the future, but it's not yet. So for us, we've, we've acquired an estate. We have a planting plan, development plan. Exactly. Well, the trees aren't in the ground yet. Or maybe they're in the ground, but they're not yet big trees. Okay. They're not yet trees that have really captured any carbon dioxide that we can go and measure and quantify. Um, it's at that delivery risk, a sort of performance mm -hmm. risk stage. You then have the stage where actually the carbon has been captured, it's been quantified, the credit has been delivered, and now we're looking more at the risk of, well, what happens if something goes wrong? What if there's a reversal? So there's a fire, let's say the trees burn down. That's the one that often gets mentioned. Isn't often it? gets mentioned. Of of wildfire. Exactly. Um, or what if there's an invalidation? Um, and then sort of across that, I think you have the kind of political price, uh, reputational type risk. So Kita's insurance that we launched first was for delivery risk. So we would insure the buyer, the investor, the lender who's putting money into a young project to protect against the risk they don't receive carbon credits in the future. Right now, we're not insuring the developer for that own risk, but you could, like, so the developer has made a commitment to deliver X number of carbon credits in the future and what happens if they're not able to do so. And this is meant as an all risks policy. So it's irrelevant as to why there's an under delivery or non delivery. It could be the fire, the wind, the pest, kind of unavoidable risks. It could be your counterparty risk like fraud or negligence or insolvency. And it could be your carbon risk like the carbon standard. So methodology is invalidated. All of these things would lead to someone not receiving the credits and losing the money and then losing the extra sort of value that credits entail. So our insurance is geared to protect that to enable more early stage investment into projects. Um, the invalidation type insurance, there's a couple of policies out there on the market now. So for people who have what you would term an ex post credit, a credit that's already been verified, like it's a real credit, 
to protect against the risk that it's invalidated. And that could be due to fraud or negligence, um, or could be due to a sort of reversal that's so significant that it damages the project and eats into any of the safety buffers. So there's some products out there around that. And then we are also developing a political risk policy. So going back to that example I gave of what happens if either I hold an asset in a country or if I'm investing in an asset in a country and the host country takes ownership of that carbon or they block its export out of the country or they implement a significant tax upon my project. These are the types of things that our insurance policy that is, should be coming out in April would protect against. That's really exciting. <clears throat> why, why don't all insurers just offer carbon insurance straight away? <laughs> There are a few reasons. So I'd say for an insurance company, probably more even than an insurance company, for the insurance industry to really go into a new market, they want to see two things. One is market size. Like they want to feel comfortable that actually there's a market here and they're going to make money. And right now the voluntary carbon market, right around two billion, that's like one client to yeah. a large insurance company. The exact thing um, is the same narrative around scale and conservation. And that, so um, you go back two years, a big project for the environment sector was 50,000 pounds. You know, only now are we starting to get yes. some traction and us and others that have managed to deploy huge amounts of capital into land acquisition for conservation. I was always told until you break a hundred million okay. and investors not even interested in the conversation. So. Fortunately, we're sat here now with a hundred million pound natural capital portfolio, and that has been our experience as well. With scale, the conversations have come to us yeah. about going to that next step, but I, I totally seen a similar pattern. Yeah, so I, I think this is all like the sort of financial services industry, actually. This is one of the problems with the carbon markets, is, or the voluntary carbon market at least, is the kind of chicken and egg of you need that investment to scale it, but you're not going to get that get investment. investment yeah. uh, but that's one, so you need the market size. Uh, second is harder, actually. You need loss history. So the way that insurance companies oh, work course. is I can look at a market and assess my profitability because I can see how many insurance claims have been paid in the past. So car insurance is a perfect example. I can look at you and say, I know your age, I know your gender, I know where you live, I know how long you've been driving, I know the type of car you drive, et cetera, et cetera. I know basically how likely you are to have a car accident because I have so many years of data. So I can price you very specifically. I'm not looking at the guys because they're going to be laughing because I don't drive a lot. Well, all right, yeah, that's a bad example. Get mocked for that. So <laughs> it's such so data rich, right? You can see yes, the exactly. volume and the, exactly. every minute of every second of every exactly. day will be a data point. And so within the carbon markets, it's not that you don't have data, but you don't have lost data specific to the insurance industry. Yeah. And so thus you have to take a guess as to how many insurance claims you're going to pay and that makes it hard. So do you end up looking for sort of a, a value transfer proposition? Where is the nearest equivalent? Yes. You look at proxies. Yeah. And again, this isn't specific just to carbon, it's any new insurance market. So probably the most relatable new insurance market we've seen over the last decade is the cyber market. So when I say cyber, it's our, you know, our data that's you know in the cloud uh, and it can be hacked and it can be stolen and it can be, you know, held ransom. Um, those risks, you know, a couple decades ago didn't really exist. And as they started to become more real and companies started to put more of a value on their data and insurance companies realized that they didn't want this intangible cyber, you know, data to be held into a normal insurance sort of property um, portfolio. They took it out and created a new insurance market for it. And that market scaled in about a decade to sort of a multi-billion pound market. But that's an analogy of in the early days, there were a lot of losses because the insurance companies didn't quite know how to price it because they had never paid an insurance claim on it before. And, and so I guess the scale of that market meant that it probably went faster because- Exactly, yeah. exactly. But carbon's the same. And so we figure, and this is the luxury of deciding to start your own business, is you can never get insurance loss data until someone's insuring it. So you need people to go first. You just do, as with any market, you need someone to go first and say, we're willing to try and we're willing to figure it out. And we realize we might have some losses, but we think that via going first, we can access the market, we can access the data such that we'll still be competitive and ideally be one of the leaders as the market grows up. But 
right now, I think those are the two things that still block the industry. You have individual companies going in, but blocking the industry is that uh, lack of market size and then the lack of certainty on the loss. Um, and the only way you fix that really is time to some extent, time and experience. And so that's what we're trying to do. And I can't say enough how I, important I think the underpinnings are to the carbon markets. So coming from the legal sector, you know, standardized contracts, ratings, like you mentioned, insurance, the kind of underpinnings of how banks work, you know, like the ability to transfer price and hold assets and know if they're an asset or a liability it's one on of the, the balance reasons we um so we did a, a really exciting debt funding package of trade us for that exact reason we wanted to work with a bank to make these products and services bankable yes exactly and make them investable and, and that's why our commitment is to scale the natural capital sector, not just the company. 100%. And, and like you, in terms of going first, we hear the same thing all the time. Well, when can I see the example of that? Or what else have you, we're the first to do this. You, yeah. you can't, we'll share everything we've done and know. We'll give you proxies for land value rise and for carbon credit prices and for renewable energy forward buying curves. And we can give you a model on what property development will look like, but no one's done the suite of these things before. And I just kind of settle on the fact that um, maps are for tourists and we're trying to be adventurous. So. <laughs> Can you talk us through how you go about designing an insurance product for carbon buyers and um, for developers? What does that process of building that look like and then ultimately bringing it to them in terms of sale? So I'm, to be honest, I think it's probably no different than designing a product in another market to some extent. So where we start out is with customer engagement. So trying to speak to people to identify if they have a problem or not. Just because you have a risk doesn't mean you want to buy insurance to cover that risk. And is there enough of those data points at the moment to do that? Has that been easy to find the customers? Yes, I'd say that has been easy because there's a lot of people who do recognize they have a risk. And so, and we have really tried to build relationships in the market. And so we know a lot of people we speak to people all the time and we've built our team so that we're just always engaging. That's actually one of our values is to be engaged and not be building things based on desk research. So we speak to a lot of people, try to identify what risk they're most worried about, and then try to identify whether or not they would pay for an insurance policy to cover that risk or if they're just going to cover that risk via contracts or portfolio construction or something like that. Then once we've identified that we think this is the risk, we then take it to insurance and we say, okay, well, this is the risk. So I'll give an example right now of the political risk policy. So the risk is that with Article 6 um, discussions and countries determining how are they going to treat their carbon within their borders, the risk is that I've invested in or I've set up a project in a country and the, the host country is going to keep my carbon, take my carbon from me. And so then we say, okay, that's the risk. What insurance policies already exist in the market that handle that risk. And one of our goals is to not recreate insurance, is to try and take existing insurance policies that are already used in other markets, whether they're how people insure their property or how people insure their forward purchase of an oil barrel, or if they insure their you know asset in, in whatever country from a political risk. There's already often an insurance policy that exists. So we try to identify what is that insurance policy that exists, um, and then we make it carbon. So we look at it and we, we work to make it more specific to ensuring that carbon risk and the wording is very, very specific there. So is um, it possible that a product that was previously used to insure an oil barrel could be used to insure a... Yeah, 100% barrel. actually. So that's our first insurance policy is based on what you call the trade credit insurance market. But one of the most common uses of this type of policy would be the forward purchase of a commodity. So it could be an, a barrel of oil where you pay for it in advance and then you expect it to be delivered to you later. And the risk is that there is a, a non-delivery. Um, or likewise, if you're the seller of the oil, the risk to you is that there's a non-payment. So you, you know, you deliver it. It's a marketer's pay. dream, that flipping that product from oil <laughs> to gas is like the most beautiful it's actually, story. To be honest, it's similar. And there's yeah. similar companies who engage in both markets as well. But it's, it's similar. So I've paid you 
Let's say in the UK, we're talking about UK Woodland Carbon Code with pending issuance units that convert to the verified carbon units. So someone pays you to buy pending issuance units and you will deliver them in the future a, a verified carbon unit and they have a risk that you might not, you might deliver them fewer than they expected or none at all. In a way that's not that dissimilar to they paid you to secure a barrel of oil and then you failed to deliver it due to, for whatever reason, maybe it got stolen by pirates or maybe, you know, you sold it to someone else or what have you. It's, it's very similar and there's related, there's almost always a related insurance policy out there. Um, one of the nuances, not to get too deep into it, is actually considering what is a carbon credit from a legal aspect, because it could work under a property portfolio, but then actually, does it fall into the, the legal definition of property or not? But there's almost always an insurance policy available. And then the final step, which does sort of overlap with the other steps, is us working with other insurance companies to see if they are willing to back us on that policy. So Kita is a type of insurance company where we develop and sell the insurance. So we would call ourselves the technical ex experts of assessing the carbon, pricing it, developing the insurance policy, but we don't hold capital ourselves to pay insurance claims. So we're actually backed by larger insurance companies who hold that regulated capital for us and pay our insurance claims. And so that's how companies can feel comfortable with our credit risk because we have backing by those larger companies. And if we were to go out of business, they would still pay our insurance claim, our client's claim. Um, but if we're gonna develop a policy, we need to get them comfortable with it. So there's a lot of work in terms of, I guess the nuance between what the carbon markets want and then what the insurance industry is willing to do. And we're somewhat of the bridge between those two sides to try and figure out what is almost always gonna be a compromise. And when is the um, climate carbon maturity and understanding existing within the large insurance companies for you to have that conversation now? Um, I would say probably not. Um, so you're having to well, do a lot of teaching in that as well? Yes, we have to do a lot of teaching. And I should be, I should caveat that. A lot of the large insurance companies are very expert in climate. Um, within the company, they'll have risk modelers and actuaries who are really expert in the assessment of natural catastrophe related risk. A lot of that assessment is linked to the risk of, to property, to you know buildings of natural catastrophe, less linked to the impact on natural capital. Uh, but a lot of people, there are a lot of experts on climate change. There's not that many experts on the carbon markets. And so it's educating in terms of how do the carbon markets work? Um, what are the key risks to a carbon credit that are separate or the same to the risks to the physical asset underpinning it? All of that, there's a lot of, what are the regulatory structures? A lot of concern actually links to the inability to assess price because insurance companies don't like to expose themselves to uncapped price risks. So you need to understand how you can cap that price liability from the insurance perspective. All of those things, we do a lot of education. And I would say we see ourselves as the bridge between the carbon markets and the insurance markets as the entity that understands the most about both and is able to connect them. Because one of the things with insurance is a lot of people often ask, well, you know, are you worried about more competition coming in? And on one hand, yeah, you know, it's always scary to have a competitor. But on the other hand, just a few insurance companies doing this is useless to everybody because there's no way that just a couple of insurance companies can insure, you know, what you said, that 100 million plus transactions executed across a lot of different spaces in the market. You need more insurance companies and the insurance industry to back this market if you're going to get the insurance capacity. And so we try and educate as much as we can. The, and it's getting better. It's the synergies are, are so similar. So we talk to people uh, in institutions and investors who are passionate and interested in climate, but have very little exposure to the realities of how you might acquire land to develop a product, a project or a product, or how, how you even get a tree in the ground or restore peatland and things. So we're trying to do that as well in terms of the um, the coaching and the development, the sharing of information. It's, it's one of the reasons for the Shoot Room Sessions podcast to try and bring this thing to people. And also the reason I write a lot. Um, the, the other bit we're absolutely committed to doing is, so we get asked about, um, are we concerned about regulation coming in? No, please bring it in as soon as possible yeah, because we intend to shoot to a bar that is yeah. so above that. And also all the people joining the space. So in, in we're just redoing our sort of marketing materials and things like that. And in there is a section in his upselling 
all the other people trying to do anything like this. So it'll be uber positive with Rob Gardner's Rebalance Earth and Highlands Rewilding and um, Natagal and Finance Earth and all the people who are trying to do, because we need to grow the entire yeah. economy and industry with all those support services we talked about, or we're going to get nowhere. One, one company can't do this and the planet needs us all to go a hell of a lot faster. So, 100%, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, da, da, da. Um, from your perspective, what does a good carbon credit look like? That's a good question. Um, so, from my perspective, a I'm gonna I'm gonna separate slightly the credit from the project. Um, the underlying project, I mean, we like it to follow, as why everyone does, the key criteria within the market. So I'd like it to be additional um, and tell me if I should explain any of these terms. But no leakage, reduced leakage. Uh, we'd like to see co-benefits. And actually, particularly on the co-benefits, one of the things that I think is really important is the engagement with the local communities. And I recognize for how hard this is. Um, but we like to see people try and put to the extent possible within their contracts and project structures means to safeguard that ongoing engagement with the community and ideally some kind of revenue share, particularly in certain countries around the world. And the reason we are really focused on that is if we're going to issue, say, a 10-year insurance policy, one of the key reasons that project could fail is because the local community decides they're not supportive of it anymore. And so we are very focused on the co-benefits and particularly that community engagement when looking at long-term projects. Where have you seen that done really well? Have you got an example of what good looks like? Yes, I've seen it done well. There's actually a, um, I don't exactly know how you would describe this company. There's sort of a, a specialist uh, developing country environmental asset investor. Um, and they build into their contracts regardless of how much profit they make, there is a ring-fenced amount that is always for the community, and it's a pretty sizable amount. And they see it, they've worked in um, such a wide range of countries, not with carbon projects, but other types of infrastructure assets that they've seen over time that if they don't ring-fence that amount of money, it just doesn't work out over time. And so it's irrelevant. It could actually eat into their profits. They'll pay that out before they... Um, even if they're not making a profit on the project, it's ring-fenced amount of money. So that's one good example we've seen. Bad examples that we've seen are really just the price not being right. Sometimes we see the price of carbon being paid is just so low that you know there's no way any money is going back to the community. No matter what they say, no matter what the contract might, there's no way any money is going back. And so we're conscious of that. There's a sort of floor price to some of these projects, which varies based on the type of project in the country and the structure. Um, but there is always a floor price where if it drops beneath that, you know, people aren't really in it for the right reasons. They're just looking to yeah. buy low, sell high. And so we're conscious we, of that. We were asked once, um, would we be open to providing reassuringly expensive carbon? <laughs> I, I like that phrase, yes, yeah. but it makes sense. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, so that's, and there's, so there's aspects of the underlying project of just that anyone would assess. You like to see the sort of underpinnings be right. Um, I'll come back to additionality, actually. But so we like the underlying project to meet the criteria of quality within the carbon markets. We then look at the risk to the project. Um, and so, for example, we'd look at the track record of the project developer. We would look at the country risk both in terms of that political risk, but also in terms of the sort of corruption indices in that country, the ability to assess things like land ownership rights. These are the kinds of things if one of, if particularly land ownership rights, if it's really hard to assess, yeah. then it might be a red flag. Um, we then focus a lot on the technical risk of the project itself. So for example, natural, natural catastrophe risk for, um, for nature-based projects, again, where you need to sort of filter the natural catastrophe risk models because they tend to be focused on property, but how do they apply to, say, a mangrove forest? But you, we need to look at that and say, actually, if you're planting trees, for example, in a place where we know there's going to be a significant fire every summer, we, how we can heard we that about Australia and it being very difficult to... Certain places are difficult. In certain projects, you know, again, you can see how they factor this in which is, again, actually comes to another point that we focus on a lot, which would be the methodology. So A, how strong is the methodology that you're using? But then also how 
how have you viewed the methodology? Like, have you been very, very bullish on your projections or have you factored into account a, a reasonable amount of losses that you think you should have? And so again, natural catastrophe, we can see projects in a country where you should have natural catastrophe. So except Canada, for example, having a lot of fires, but certain projects will have factored in. They expect to have, you know, six fires across this time frame. And they factor that into the amount of carbon forecast from that project. And so if we look at that and we say, actually, yeah, we think they factored in their risk quite effectively, then we're more comfortable ensuring the output than if we look at someone who sort of modeled it based on the best case scenario across the entirety of the life, because you know something's going to go wrong that isn't modeled, and then we're more li liable to pay a claim. Um, so those are the things. I suppose we look at the underpinning. I tend to separate out the quality of the project from a carbon perspective from the risk of the project from an insurance perspective and if the underlying project we don't think is meeting the core purpose of being able to capture carbon dioxide without causing any harm then we won't insure it but then again we won't insure a project that is too high risk across any of those kind of categories that we look at does that make sense there's quite a lot to that and it does differ you know, forestry, afforestation is different from avoid deforestation to uh, mangroves to grassland. And then you have your biochar and your enhanced rock weathering and your director, like it's all different. So they all have their own risks, but some risks like your counterparty risk and your country risk and your methodology risk, these are the sort of more stable factors that we're always assessing. It's the technical risk that tends to vary widely. Between so if projects. you were, if you were sort of passing a sort of general opinion on Woodland Carbon Code afforestation projects in the UK, how does that stack up as a carbon credit in comparison to what else you could buy around the world? So, I mean, I think the, you have good carbon, you have good carbon credits from a lot of different projects. I think it starts to become more of a nuance in terms of what the buyer wants. So let's say a woodland carbon credit from the UK versus a, uh, you know, afforestation credit from, from let's say, Colombia. Um, they could both be great projects. I would see buyers probably preferring the UK credit if they are more focused on really wanting to be able to go and see the project. You know, you get a lot of UK buyers who want to just see the project, feel the project if they feel like they want to be supporting the UK because that's where they're based and that's where the majority of their team is based. Um, if they're more worried maybe around what happens if there is a legal problem that goes wrong and they want to feel security in that land ownership, right? In that rule of law and that ability to see and find their counterparty. I think these are the safety factors of the UK mm -hmm. carbon. I think the challenge to UK woodland carbon in particular is just the trees grow really slowly. So while you have the safety of the, the country and the rule of law, you have a bit more risk in terms of the length of time that you might be waiting from the time that you purchase a pending issuance unit to the time that you are delivered a verified carbon unit. I think that will mitigate as more projects in the UK grow up. But right now where a lot of projects are starting, the buyer or the investor has a pretty long wait before they get and their scale return. the challenge as well. Yeah, exactly. So I honestly, people often ask me, you know, if we have a preference and I honestly don't, I think we need all sorts of different projects and all sorts of different countries. I think people just need to be conscious of the, the pros and cons of the different projects as it applies to them. So based on their own risk appetite, they should understand the risks they're taking on with this project versus this project so they can make an educated decision versus sometimes I feel people just sometimes slightly stumble into it and then don't realize that they might be taking on a significant risk that they didn't intend to. I think it's a bit like the behavior you see when people are trying to buy vehicles or cars. There's a whole range of things. You can buy a Tesla or you can buy the small independent car that's made in the country of choice that you happen to want to do. Um, and you, yeah, purposeful informed choice about what is it you want that yes. credit to do beyond just the ton of carbon. Yes, exactly. I think is really important. And even with the ton of carbon, how secure do you want to feel in that ton of carbon? So let's look at, um, I don't know, enhanced rock weathering versus direct air capture as two examples. Direct air capture is a closed system loop. 
So it's capturing carbon out of the air, but it's once it's up and running, it's relatively easy to quantify how much carbon has been has been removed. It's a closed system. And hand-struck weathering is spreading crushed rock on fields and then monitoring how they capture carbon and get sort of flushed out into the ocean over time. It's an open system. There's a lot of things that can impact. You're always going to have more uncertainty with an enhanced rock weathering project than you are with a DAC project, but it doesn't make direct air capture better than enhanced rock weathering. Just you as the buyer need to understand that with this side, you might be getting more co-benefits in terms of soil health, your yeah. crop yield, but you're losing some of that certainty. And so you should factor that into how much you buy. Read, uh, it's, um, just a, it's just conscious choices. Have you ever read uh, Alchemy by Rory Sutherland? No, I haven't. He's um, a marketing genius guru, but also a behavioral psychologist. One of his rules is people never behave as they say they will, <laughs> and they don't make coherent choices when they purchase things in the way they say they will. So you, you, might be, you might show someone the perfect science. They might walk in and say, I want that direct closed loop capture but I'm actually kind of into rocks. So I'd, I'd like the, the <laughs> yeah. hands weathering. Or you get people who just want, they, they believe the world is solved by physical tech. So they want the direct 100%. capture. Yeah, so then people would make those choices. For us, we're obviously proponents of nature-based solutions because we think it does way more than just capture the carbon, the co-benefits that you describe and um, for people and wildlife across the country. So yeah, purposeful choices and we need more products than we currently have at the moment. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest headache you face today that you wish you could solve? When you walk out the room, if you had a magic wand and you could solve a problem in your business, what would it be? That's a good question. It doesn't have to be on the insurance side of things. It can be anywhere across the business. No. What's the one that... I mean, there's two in my mind. I think my actual normal answer to this question is education for the insurance side. Yeah. Because... It's just over time, insurance, I'm sure, will become a normal part of this market, just like it is in any market like this, where there's physical assets and there's trading and there's buying and there's long term risk horizons and there can be high risk countries. Um, but right now it's too new, so it's not yet normal. But if it was, there wouldn't be an opportunity, right? Well, you know, but I guess it's the education to help people understand how it can be utilized and how it's not just a cost but actually how it can really help free up capital. It can help you deploy more. It could help you to sell your carbon at a higher value. All of these things. I think there's a big education piece. Or if I could snap my finger and move a year forward and have done a year's worth of education, you know, that would be great fun for me. Nice. <laughs> I think the flip side actually is less to do with insurance, um, though it does link into it, but it's more around the financial institutions or the financial industry. I think I would love to be able to, again, snap my fingers and have the underpinnings of the uh, ways, the underpinnings of the financial services industry just immediately transfer over into the carbon space. So you'd have standardized contracts, you'd have consistent means of auditing accounts, you would understand how carbon is viewed as an asset or liability from an accounting treatment perspective. All of these things that would make a financial institution who wants to move into carbon be able to look at the risks and say, ah, yes, not just do I see this as a growth opportunity in terms of a new business model or, not, or do I see it as, you know, I do need carbon credits for my own net zero strategy, but actually the head of risk, the chief operations officer, the CFO is like, oh, yes, I understand it. It slots into my P&L here. That would be amazing. I think that would really change the needle. And I know there are companies um, looking to work in that space and I wish them all <laughs> our, um, the best. Our amazing finance director, Ellie Adams, is sat at home punching the air as you're saying that. <laughs> yeah. like, yes, that's exactly what we need. That's exactly what we need. Possibly quite fitting for a topic that's largely based on insurance, but I'm going to ask you to predict the future now. What do you think, if we're sat here in five years' time, how will carbon markets and um, the sort of overall natural capital industry have changed? In five years' time? You can pick a different time domain if you have a preferable one, as long, <laughs> as, long as it's not tomorrow, as long as it's forward looking. I'll give you 10 years time. Okay. I feel five years time, if I'm feeling pessimistic, I'm not sure how much will have changed. I feel like the 
disclosure regi regimes will be kicking in a little bit more by then. You know, companies will be really noting how they need to disclose, how carbon buying and offsetting is part of that. I think there will be more progress in the accounting treatment of carbon credits as well as carbon and climate investments more widely. I think all of these things will be very, very positive. Um, maybe I'll stick with five years, actually. Why not? Um, I think so I think that will be a positive driver, but I don't think it will be a complete game changer by five years, uh, unless maybe the liabilities for inaction have been made a little bit more of a big stick. It bites a bit more, yeah. yeah. Or on the flip side, if the carrot for action has been made a little bit more clear. But right now I feel like we're a bit more about making the liability a bit of a bigger stick. So I think there'll be progress, but not complete, you know, sort of 180 flip there. I think Corsia could be an interesting change. So the Corsia, the, the um, sort of offsetting rules for the international aviation industry are moving from the pilot phase right now into phase one. And what this does is in essence set a regulatory framework for, for airline operators between certain countries, but 126 countries that state how they need to purchase carbon credits in order to, to operate between those countries. And the, the framework between phase, pilot phase and phase one is significantly greater and very specific about the types of carbon these companies can buy. And my understanding of it is that the purchasing requirements of the airline industry would be about one third to two thirds of the total carbon credits available in the market today. So that again could be a, by sort of 2028 time, a real shift in the supply demand dynamics, which would then, again, especially if those disclosure regimes are starting to have more impact, really start to lead to that supply shortage that I think people have projected in terms of their pricing forecasts for 2030. Uh, and then I guess the final thing, which is why originally I said I didn't want to forecast five years, but now I've stuck to it a minute, <laughs> is the shift to the more regulated market. So moving from voluntary to compliance, I don't think we'll see that in five years time. I think it will take our governments slightly longer to really figure out how and when that should happen. But I do think we will increasingly see the melding of the voluntary into the compliance. And I think if we're able to see that, I think that gives a real price indicator for the, again, the financial institutions who are coming into the market today, I think looking to secure a price and supply, but often in order to build a business such that they can sell those credits to corporate buyers later. Yeah. And the more that you see those indicators that the voluntary will merge into the compliance, the stronger those price signals are that actually we're gonna have a floor price so I can feel relatively more comfortable investing today because I, I can see this more greater security of my return. But I don't think we're gonna see, uh, so again, some kind of night and day within five years. But that is my view. I think I would love to say that I think it's gonna be a thousand times better, but I think it'll be incremental steps better but probably, to be fair, if we if we were five years in the future, um, and we transplanted there like magic, I think we, I feel like we're going to be happy with where it is. But I hope by sort of the twenty thirty five time is when there'd really be that that shift in terms of how people are buying and how the price is. And and also, I do think again, you, right now you have a lot of young companies starting up. Um, a lot of them are going to fail, but you're going to have some companies that are really successful and that 10 years in the future are not a startup, but are an established company that has that balance sheet that I think is increasingly essential to play in this market in order to get the supply of even like seedlings, right? You know, how do you get these supply at appropriate prices? I think we'll start to see more really established companies that are strong in their own right. Mm. And there's so much there. Um, <laughs> one, one thing I think is, and it was a colleague of ours who's actually uh, a marketing director at an institutional fund. He said one of the big problems he thinks is the word voluntary. Hmm. He said he thinks if the distinction had been regulated and private carbon markets, there would have been way more traction already. Yeah, the word right. voluntary just softens it too much. Oh, you don't need yeah. to do it then. 
Yeah. Whereas if it was private, it would it would gather more traction. That's a good point. I agree yeah. with that. Um, I can't take any credit for it. I can't name check him either. But well done. <laughs> great, great point. <laughs> um, so, and and the other one is the the sort of rate of change. So you think five years forward, and I and I agree with you. We we actually had some really exciting meetings with um, some shadow Secretary of States this morning talking about their future ambitions. Um, so this will be going out. Who knows when an election is? But so with the Labour Party this morning about what they think about the future. I was explaining a lot of these changes you want to see, whether it be nature or climate, you're going to need to win a third term to see them mm -hmm. because it's going to take 10 years. If you want to start a wind farm on land you own today, it's going to take you a decade to see a turbine blade turn. If you want to actually sell a carbon credit that's verified, it's going to take you five to 10 years to do that with the, the rate of tree growth. So we are going to need that time. But on the flip side, I think how much has changed in the last five years? That's true. So um, no one was buying land at scale for conservation outside of maybe Anders Paulson and um, wildlands but outside of that no one was and now there's a whole swathe of companies doing that from the wildlife trust and the rivers trust through to the private organization so i'm going to choose optimism and choose yeah. hopefully five years we we make a lot a lot way um but 10 definitely that um and the other thing is as well i think we'll we need those outliers like you guys and us that were hopefully setting the boundaries of what's possible and every time we announce something exciting on the next step, my hope is five new seedling startups beginning. Oh, I yeah, could add to that market. I could contribute this bit. We could help in that way. And it's why um, one of the bugbears I have is the reliance on the environment sector keep trying to use volunteers for things. So a volunteer planting a tree is a lovely, wholesome thing, but it stops the professionalization of those skills. Yeah, so if you're not prepared to pay someone to plant your trees, how can you be confident of your delivery risk? You yes, know, in terms that's very of true. trees in the ground in the right way. So we're trying to blend both and encourage people to be on our sites and interact with them, but also working with a really great company. Shout out to Delta Forest. Thank you for their help getting trees in the ground safely and securely and ensuring their longevity. So we all need to be prepared to pay to build those systems and services in 100%, industries we, we need 100%. The yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, let's go beyond carbon a little bit. Do you think, um, or have you started looking at how nature credits will fit in and, and insuring for BNG, for example, and things like that? I say we haven't looked at it yet. Again, on the basis of we can only do so much. Yeah. And I think I heard once someone um, describe it as a game of whack-a-mole running a new business because yeah. there's always a new opportunity there and they're always great and you just have to say no. Yeah, it's the art of saying no to things rather yes. than the yes is right. Exactly, and it's very hard. So for right this moment, like this year, that's one of our no's. Yeah. But when we first set up Keto and we thought about what is Keto of 2030, we didn't see it as just carbon. We saw it as a wider natural capital insurer. And so what we are building, we do think translates well to wider natural capital markets, including biodiversity net gain credits. We're just not doing it yet. Um, just focus on carbon for the minute, try and execute that well. And then once we feel we're doing that and it's running, then we'll move on. We, we, we've made similar decisions about, we're not yet developing new build properties. So on the portfolio we own at the moment, we have sort of 15 to 20 planning permissions that are in place already. We're not looking to action those in the next 12 months. We're yeah. plenty big enough focused on, on what we're doing already, plenty busy enough focused on that already. The other bit is true of education in the broader sense. So exactly as you described, we're trying to educate the industry and more than educate, share what we know, mistakes as, along the way as well. And people, oh, are you, are you having more school groups or education in that way? We're not teachers. We're letting the teachers teach. We're opening our land up as much as possible to the point of you can't have too many people in a protected landscape because it does damage. So there's a balance to be struck. But we want to share as much as possible but we're not setting up an educational institution. Yeah, you know, we're, yeah, not, we're not trying to yeah. achieve that one as well. We're trying to stay in our lane, do our bit yeah. about scaling conservation as best as we can. Um, I think one thing, this is just links to that, I suppose. I think once I heard someone talk about um, nature restoration as this balancing act between nature being either this kind of sort of the world's trash can where f people feel completely justified in just chucking their trash and not thinking about it, versus it this kind of pristine other that's beautiful, but it's over there and I can't touch it. And I feel like for you, probably the challenge is that balancing act between the two, because people seeing it and understanding it and being able to benefit from just you know, walking through the woods is a beautiful thing. But then if there's too much of it, then you, you start to get into that yeah, damage. Yeah, absolutely right. Act. 
So L L uh, the head of storytelling is in the room as well, and that's one of her lines. It's like if you expect people to love and protect the environment, they've got to be able to yeah. touch it and understand 100%. it and see it. The best example we've got for that is we're very fortunate to own 800 acres on Dartmoor, and that includes 130 acres of temperate rainforest, which is just, it's like Narnia. Albeit, I got a shout out from a colleague the other day that said, no, Narnia was set in Northern Ireland. It's like Narnia. It's not <laughs> Narnia. Um, but it is breathtakingly different. But even we're very cautious about how often we visit because the reason it's beautiful is because people didn't visit it for hundreds of years and it's yeah. had very few footprints yeah. through there so we try and be as protective as possible but yeah it is such a balance we want to welcome people ecotourism and visitors is a great revenue stream if we can make that work but it can't be everyone everywhere Great. because too many people Great. do do damage i'll just say one more thing on this which no, is um do. one i think it's fun to have kids to help teach them that you know it's the go out and get muddy and get yeah. your hands dirty and and then second, I used to lead backpacking trips and we also always did the leave no trace. And one of the ways that you leave no trace is always walking through the path, even if it's super muddy, because every time someone goes around, right, you just sort of eat and eat into the woods. And so my uh, people within the Kita team always make fun of me because my shoes are always muddy. Because I know you're there too. We're both sat here with gosh, we need a photo of this to hook in after. We're both sat with very muddy boots on for that very reason. Mine well, are actually very clean today. But I walk through the woods to get to the train station and I always go through the puddle because I hate to expand the path. And so it's that kind of thing too. It's little things that I think you can do. Yeah, we'll keep expanding the paths in the business world, not, not in the natural, not in the natural world. world. Exactly. That is a a perfect full stop on what's been a <laughs> fascinating conversation. Thank you for, of all the things that you have to say no to at the moment, thank you for not saying no to this one. No, I really of course, appreciate thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Bye, guys. Thank you.